Dr. Masilang is uh, not new to the game in terms of gender and development for GAD. Uh, she has had a number of encounters with organizations and in fact, she has been or she was engaged in several committees uh, that handled gender and development not only in Cebu but outside the Philippines uh, up to the United Nations where she participated in a number of conferences on gender issues. She was also trained as um, a social scientist, uh, political science in particular, but her PhD in the UP system was in Philippine studies. Uh, uh, Dr. Masilang Bukoy uh, was appointed chair of the Philippine Commission Women on account of her experience and uh, multiple engagements uh, in uh, gender and development uh, activities. And uh, with that, she he has carried on the task of uh, doing research as well as speaking uh, engagements in uh, several fora uh, in and out of the Philippines. Uh, um, her her um, position also enabled her to serve as um, the lead person in the Philippine delegation to UN conferences on status of women from 2017 until 2020. So that's still very recent before the pandemic. I'm glad to meet Durai, uh, as we call her in MSU, because we belong to the same BATS. We studied at the same year and graduated together at Mindanao State University way back in the uh, 1960s. So this is an opportunity uh, that we uh, engage each other, uh, although virtually. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I'm now um, uh, um, ready to present her, our speaker for today's uh, webinar of the Nice of Rizal Aloha chapter, Dr. Rodora Bukui. Thank you very much, Dr. Fred Magdalena. I'm happy to see you virtually. Also, thanks to Dr. June Colmenares and the Knights of Rizal Aloha chapter for inviting me to, to lecture or converse with you on Rizal's notion on, on women. And I would like to greet my friends from UP, from the Mindanao State University, from the Mindanao State University IIT, and we are also here, uh, our uh, columnist from Sunstar Cebu, Carbs, who is also an expert on, uh, on uh, development in Mindanao. And I'm happy to, to welcome friends from UP Los Banos, Dr. Helen Dayo, Dr. Blessy, and your students in the College of Veterinary Medicine. I'm amazed that there are future veterinarians interested in knowing about Rizal's feminism. So uh, I would like to thank uh, Reg for helping me share my PowerPoint. So let me now proceed to my presentation. I would rather call this a conversation. And my paper is entitled Revisiting Jose Rizal's Notion of the Woman Question. And uh, really it's a revisiting because I have stopped teaching Rizal for many, many years. And so when June invited me, I have to, to unearth my documents. And many of these are left in UP Cebu and I could not enter the premises of the school. So I have to rely on the online materials and those given by June for me to prepare this lecture. And um, Next slide, please. When we say about what is the woman question, uh, the woman question referred generally to the articulation of the women's movement for gender equality and women empowerment. And that um, in the 19th century to 20th century, it specifically referred to 
the problem of women's suffrage because in the 19th century, women were not allowed to vote. And women's status was similar to that of the slaves and the other marginalized. So that becomes a very important rallying point of the women's movement in the early part of 19th century. And more broadly, when we talk about woman question, it differed to changing the political, economic, social, cultural status of women, calling for sexual and social li uh, liberation, which gained urgency in the 19th and 20th century. And in the words of Sister Mary John Mananzan, one of the leading feminist theologians in the Philippines, the woman question is a global, systemic, and ideological question. So as shown in the next slide, I will focus on Rizal's notion of the woman question, specifically his view on women's oppression and marginality as, uh, as shown or as articulated in her letter to the women of Malolos, his uh, perspective on the root causes of women's subordination in 19th century Philippines and his preferred solution to address women's oppression or marginality in the role of women and social change. Let me provide a background of the results letter to the women of Malolos as shown on screen in the next slide. Rizal's letter to the young women of Malolos is a very famous essay and uh, it, it was penned by Rizal while she, he was annotating Morgas Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas on February uh, 1889. And uh, to Carmen Guerrero Nakpel, uh, this remains the most authoritative feminist essay in Philippine literature. And originally this was written in Tagalog upon the request of Marcelo H. Del Pilar, the editor of the La Solidaridad, which was based in Barcelona, Spain. So I have to refer to the Tagalog version to ensure that the English translation which I used would be proximate to what Rizal meant. Next slide, please. The letter was intended to commend the brave Malolenias. Uh, this was uh, the Malolenias or the young women of Malolos, Bulacan, relentlessly petitioned the Spanish Governor General Valeriano Whaler to open a night school for women to learn Spanish under the tutorship of Teodoro Sandico. If you look at Philippine history, Teodoro Sandico became one of the senators in, uh, in the recent times and that he was known also, uh, he was linked also with the propaganda movement. And uh, th this letter was penned by Rizal at a crucial period of our history seven years prior to the outbreak of the Philippine Revolution in 1896, and um, also the martyrdom of Rizal on December 30, 1896. As shown in the next slide, I have here, uh, I tried to make a rapid review of related literature on Rizal's feminism. And these were some that were very much uh, pronounced in the, in the online sources, like the writings of Carmen Guerrero Napil, very related to Rizal, uh, Epifanio San Juan, Pe Durano, and Albina Pexon Fernandez, uh, the late Albina Pexon Fernandez of the UP Center for Women's Studies. And uh, according to uh, Carmen Guerrero Napil, uh, very, very famous essayist on Philippine history and culture, she describes the work, the letter of Rizal to the women of Malolos as revolutionary, containing revolutionary rhetoric, which shared the high-minded preachiness of the La Solidaridad, the paper of the propaganda movement. And, uh, and she said that this letter throbbed with anti-clericalism of the La Vision of Frey Rodriguez and the progressiveness of Port Telepono, another essay of Jose Rizal. Isan Juan is, uh, for those who are interested more on his work, 
he wrote using postmodern and postcolonial reading. And he said that through Rizal's works, especially his novels, he had tried to question the patriarchal order that existed during the Spanish colonial period, and also providing critique of the social division of labor in the Philippines during the Spanish era. And thus through the characters, Sisa, Maria Clara, Salome, and others, he significantly uh, foregrounded the critique of Rizal on priolocracy and Spanish uh, patriarchy. So um, Maria Fed Rano uh, wrote about Rizal's ideas on women using uh, uh, the perspective of Nosboom and Amartya Sen, and that uh, she said that Rizal's view of reason is similarly, uh, is basically uh, grounded on the, on, the, on the ideas of the age of enlightenment and that she said that Rizal's view on reason connects with uh, the material she used, Amartya Sen and Nosboom, which regards women as bearers of intrinsic value, helping identify not only the potential but also the limits of Rizal's argument. Albina Fernandez uh, using the using a Marxist and socialist feminist perspective uh, allows us to see uh, how the women develop what she said was a false consciousness as a result of Spanish colonialism and Spanish philocracy. It's very important to refer to, to her article because um, in, uh, in Al Albina Fexon Fernandez's uh, writing, she, she uh, discussed the status of women and that she said that at the time of the Spanish colonial period, women lost their independence and autonomy that existed in the pre-conquest period. So let's move on to the next slide to show who were the women of Malolos. You know, the Malolos is a very important uh, region or a very important place in Philippine history because this was the seat of the, of the first Philippine Republic, Malolos, Bulacan. And the brave women flash on screen, you would notice that they all have uh, similar family names like Tanchanko, Reyes, San, Tanto, Santos, Chongsons, and basically they are related by blood or by affinity. And according to the records, uh, they are uh, they emerge from the Sangli Mestizo class in the town of uh, Malolos, and that they all live in the Chinese neighborhood of Malolos called Parian Silio. And that uh, during the Philippine Revolution, they were very active in supporting the revolutionary struggle, joining the established Red Cross, the Red Cross established by the wife of Emilio Aguinaldo. And at some point, they were very active in supporting Rizal sisters in calling for clemency or pardon of Rizal, who was then banished to the Pitan before his execution in Manila. So uh, these were the 20 women, brave women that wrote uh, Governor General Whaler sent the petition to open a school to let them learn Spanish, which is basically a language which would allow them to, to connect with the, with, the, with the world. And since language was the medium in the universities, that, that became a very important language to propagate uh, feminism as well as the nationalism of the Filipinos. So in the, as shown in the next slide, Rizal loaded the Malulenias for, uh, we can skip on that, I already discussed the class origin of the Malulenias. Uh, Rizal loaded the women of Mal Malolos for their courage. And uh, Rizal said at the opening of the letter that it was true that there were abundance of girls with agreeable manners, charming ways and modest bearing. But to him, there was, there was in all an admixture of servitude and deference to the words or whims of the so-called spiritual leaders, the spiritual fathers. Rizal said they were like drooping plants 
sown and grown in darkness, whose flowers were without perfume, and whose fruits were juiceless. But now, Rizal said, with the news of the activism of these women of Malolos, Rizal changed her mind and she, he said, I have realized my mistake and have rejoiced greatly because of the courage of the women of Malolos. As shown in the next slide would be excerpts about, uh, about um, how Rizal looked at the struggle of the Malolenias. And he said in the letter that the action of the women brought hope to the Filipino struggle, which was based in Spain at the time. He said, you have awakened new hopes among the compatriots and inspired vigor to face adver adversities with the women as allies. He used the word allies in the, the translation is allies. And he said, no longer will the Filipinos stand with their head bowed nor does she spend her time on her knees. No longer will the mother contribute to keeping her daughter in darkness and bring her up in contempt and moral annihilation. And no longer the science of all sciences consists in blind submission to any unjust order or an extreme complacency, nor a courteous smile be deemed the only weapon against insults or humble tears, the ineffable panacea to all tribulations, and quotes. Next slide, please. One of the very important themes of Rizal's letter to the women of Malolos is on religiousness, which, which Rizal referred to as pagkabanal. And here you, cutting across the letter, was his critique of phrylocracia or friarocracy, referring to the dominant role or the hegemonic role of the priles or the friars in the social, political, and economic lives of the natives in the 19th century. Rizal said at this point, the will of God is different from that of the priests, that religiousness does not consist in long periods spent on your knees, nor in endless prayers, big rosaries, and grimy scapulars. In Tagalog, he said, labaging scapulars, but in spotless conduct, firm intention, and upright judgment. You also know that prudence that not, does not consist in blindly obeying any whims of the little tin god, referring to the friday, but in obeying that which is reasonable, and just. It is cowardice and er erroneous to believe that saintliness or pagkabanal consists in blind obedience and that prudence and the habit of the thinking are presumptuous. In the original text of Rizal, pagkala, pagka, pagkala, pagkamalalo or arrogant, no? God, the primar, primal source of all wisdom, Rizal said, does not demand that human beings created in God's image and likeness allow himself or herself to be deceived and hoodwinked, but wants us to use and let shine the, the light of reason which God mercifully endowed on human beings. I would like to note at this point that the English translation of Rizal's letter need to be, ge to be gender sensitized. So the need for gender fair language in the translation is noted at this point. And uh, in Tagalog, you will note that the Tagalog language is not sexist, and these, there is no reference to he in the Tagalog uh, text of Rizal's letter to the women of Malolos. As shown in the next slide, Rizal talk about mothers being responsible for the servitude of our compatriots. He did not say men, he ref because he was writing to women, so he also called attention to the fact that mothers are responsible for the servitude of our compatriots. He said, youth is the flower bed that is to bear fruit and must accumulate wealth for its descendants. And wealth here does not refer to material wealth, but includes uh, the inculcation of uh, positive values to the children or to the, to the children or the offspring. 
What is offspring will be that of a woman whose kindness of character is expressed in mumbled prayers, who knows nothing by heart but awits or hymns, novenas and the alleged miracles, whose amusements consist in, in playing pangingi, pangingi or card game, or in the frequent con confessions of the same sins. What sons will she have but acolytes, priest servants or cockfighters? It is the mothers who are responsible for the servitude of our compatriots, owing to the unlimited trust, trustfulness of their loving hearts, to the ardent desire to elevate their sons. Next slide. Running through the letter, as I've said, is the critique of Philoprasia. The independent and enterprising Mujer Indigena in the pre-colonial era became subjugated with the imposition of Philoprasia. The dominance of Catholicism as introduced by the friars subverted, subverted the natives. Women were now consigned to the three Ks. What are this? The Kirch, Kirch, Kindergarten, meaning Kurtz Church, Kurtzy Kitchen, Kindergarten, referring to, to the children. In the article of uh, Pexon Fernandez, she said that the Filipina at this point in time have lost the pre-conquest independence autonomy of the, of the Mujer Indigena. The Filipina during the coming of the uh, before the coming of the Spaniards, enjoyed sexual freedom, enjoyed the status of the Babaylanes, who were pre-colonial uh, healers and spiritual leaders in the communities. In pre-colonial times, women could inherit property and succeed their fathers as leaders. And we even have stories of legendary women in our prehistory who were very important leaders like Queen Sima and Princess Sorduha, among others. Rizal clearly had a solid grounding in history. As a matter of fact, he annotated Morga Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas to prove that as people, we have our culture and our civilization prior to conquest. And it was conquest that destroyed the advancement of these pre-colonial societies that existed. Cursed be they who turn a dead ear to the supplications of the poor, Rizal said in the letter. Only give to him who has plenty and spend their money lavishly on silver altar hangings for the thanksgiving or in the serenades and fireworks, especially during festas. The money ground out of the poor is bequeathed to the master so that he can provide for chains to subjugate and hire thugs and executioner. Oh, what blindness, what lack of understanding. Next slide. Talk some more about the role of the mothers. Maturity is the fruit of infancy and the infant is formed at the lap of the mother. The mother who can teach only her children how to kneel and kiss hands of the friars must not expect sons with blood other than that of the vile slaves. There will be more of this discussion, the role of the mothers in the succeeding presentation. As shown in the next slide, result of talk about corruption in the church, why the friars now refuse to steer a foot unless paid in advance, and as if they were starving, they sell scapularies, rosaries, bits and other things which are nothing but schemes for making money and detriment to the soul, unquote. Rizal referred to the mothers as influencers in the creation of the consciousness of their children. As shown in the next slide, Rizal's thesis is that friarocracy and its version of religiosity led to the blind obedience and submission of the natives. This is still on reason and saintlessness. The discussion of the mother will follow. Rizal said, saintlessness, saintliness or pagkabanal 
consists in the first place in obeying the dictates of reason, happen what may. If, if it is acts and not words that I want of you, said Christ, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth did not give the kiss of peace to the Pharisees and never gave his hand to be kissed. God did not cater to the rich and the vain. He did not mention scapularies, nor he did make groceries or solicit offering for the sacrifice of the mass or exact payment for his prayers. He asked the question, can God be bought, brought off and be blinded by money, nothing more or less than a friar? At this point, Rizal said, if that is the God whom the friars adore, then I turn my back upon that God. Next slide. Rizal elaborates on mothers as the first influencers of children's consciousness. Let us be reasonable, she said. He said, and open our eyes, especially you women. Be sure you are, because you are the first to influence the consciousness of your children. He advised the women to be good mothers and that a good mother does not resemble the mother that the friar has created. She must bring up the child as the image of the true God who is the, quote, the father of all, who is just, who does not suck the, the lifeblood of the poor like a vampire, nor scoff at the agony of the sorely beset, nor makes a crooked path of the path of justice. Awaken and prepare the will of the children towards all that is honorable, to all that is sincere and firm of purpose, clear judgment, clear procedures, honesty in act and deed, love for fellow men, and respect for God. The children's minds must be fortified from future adversities, adversities and accustom them to danger. Take note that Rizal here emphasized the role of the mothers in the socialization process of the children. Next slide. As to what caused Asia's backwardness, Rizal said in the let letter that it is ignorance and slavery. So long as the Filipino mothers are hoodwinked into slavery, their children will also be slaves. The backwardness of Asia lies in the fact that there the women are ignorant, are slaves, while Europe and America are powerful because their women are free and well-educated and endowed with lucid intellect and strong will. So take note here that uh, the ignorance of the Filipina is seen by Rizal as the outcome of the feudal and educational system that existed during the Spanish colonial era and that um, he traces the backwardness of, the, of our country or of Asia as a whole to the ignorance, to the slavery of the people at that time. Next slide. In the letter, results uh, devoted a, a long paragraph about defending the honor of the Filipina because a lot of Spanish travelers and the friars themselves have um, told stories about the, the sexuality of the women, they're being, uh, they're being uh, open, up, uh, they're being hospitable to the extent that they offer their bodies to their guests. And so Rizal was very much angered about all these uh, stories uh, degrading the Filipino women. And she said at this point, he said at this point that the, the Malolenias lack instructive books and that is nothing is added day to day to the intellect of the women save that which is intended to dim its natural brightness. And so uh, he proceeded in saying that's very important to dissipate the mist that befugs our people, referring to obscurantism or religious fanaticism. And with, with God's help, restore the pristine condition and fame of the Filipina 
in whom we now miss only a criterion of her home because good qualities she has enough and to spare. The desire we cherish in our hearts, Rizal said, is to restore the honor of women who is half of our heart, so meaning kapuso, yung mga kababaihan, our companion in the joys and tribulations of life. And in response to the maligning of the Filipino women, Rizal said, are the Spanish women all cut after the patterns of the Holy Virgin Mary and the Filipinas all reprobates? Rizal asked in the letter. As shown in the next slide, Rizal gave advice to the young women even as to their choice of partners. He said, require of your lovers a noble and honored name, a manly, quote unquote, heart, offering protection to your weakness and a high spirit incapable of being satisfied with in engendering slaves. Young women, Rizal said, should act nobly and not deliver her youth to the weak and faint-hearted. Next slide. Rizal also had advice to the married women. He said, she must aid her husband inspire him with courage, share his perils, refrain from causing his husband's worry and sweeten his moments of affection, always remembering that there is no grief that a brave heart cannot bear and there is no bitterer inheritance than that of infamy and slavery. Open your children's eyes so that they may be jealously guard their honor, love their fellow men and their native land and do their duty. Always impress upon them, they must prefer dying with honor to living with this honor. Rizal at this point in the letter exhorted women to imbue their children with patriotism, citing the women of Sparta's example. So Rizal elaborated that the women of Sparta, the mothers, the Spartan mothers, would prefer their children to die fighting for Sparta. So that's the example that Rizal cited for courageous women who are willing to offer their children in defense of the homeland. As shown in the next slide, Rizal at the end concluded or asked the women to make a critical reflection of what he was talking about or as he was saying in the letter. And he said, think it over and shift it carefully through the sieve of reason not just believing simply because it is I who are saying this. Quote, he said, I do not pretend to be looked upon as an idol or fetish and to be believed and listened to with the eyes closed and the head bowed and the arms crossed over the breasts. And as shown in the next slide, there are seven uh, concluding points that Rizal wrote in his letter. First, he said, of all tyranny of some is possible only through the cowardice and negligence on the part of the others. There is a similar quotation that is very popular, like there are no tyrants when there are no slaves. Sl uh, tyranny exists only because we allow ourselves to be enslaved. Second result said, what makes one contemptible is lack of dignity and abject fear of him holds one in contempt. So upholding always dignity and standing up for what you believe in. Third, Rizal said, repeated again that this view, ignorance is servitude. Because as a man, quote, thinks so he is. A man who does not think for himself and allows himself to be guided by the thought of another is like a beast led by a halter. Note, translation again need to use gender sensitive language. The fourth, fifth, and sixth concluding points of Rizal says, he who loves his independence must first aid his fellow men or uh, compatriots because he who refuses protection to others will find himself without it. The isolated rib in the buri is easily broken, but not so the broom made of the ribs of the palm bound together. So he talks about the need for solidarity, the need for unity, and the need for, for uh, working 
for each other and helping each other. This is in the context of the propaganda movement and the reform movement that they were engaging in at this point in time. If, if the Filipina will not change her mode of being, Rizal said, let her rear no more children. Let her merely give birth to them. She must cease to be the mistress of the home or in her, his original text, alisin sa kanya ang kapangyarihan sa bahay. Rizal is trying to tell us that uh, being the mother and being the one responsible for the nurturance and the socialization of the kids, uh, the women exercise authority. And if the mother cannot do this well, then Rizal said, uh, if the women remains, uh, remain subjugated, remains enslaved, remain ignorant and fanatic, they don't change their mode of being, then she should not be given the privilege of rearing her children because she will only produce what? slave mentality and slave kids or children. The next uh, six, seven concluding points. All human beings are equal, naked without bonds. In the original text of Rizal, he said, ang tao ay pares pares. So take note that in the original text, uh, he was, uh, he didn't say men, all men are equal. He was talking about ang lahat ay pares pares, equal. All human beings are equal naked when you are born without bonds. God did not create man to be slave nor endow him with intelligence, to have him winked or adore him with reason, to have him deceived by others. It is not fatuous or hindi kapalaluan ang pagsamba sa kapwa. To refuse to worship one's equal, to cultivate one's intellect and to make use of reason in all things. Fatuous is he who makes God of him, referring to the friar, who makes brute of others and who strives to submit to his whims all that is reasonable and just. And the last concluding point, he said, consider well the kind of religion they are teaching you. See whether it is the will of God or according to the teachings of Christ that the poor be succored and those who suffer alleviated. Consider what they are preaching to you the object of the sermon, what is behind the masses, novenas, rosaries, scapularis, images, miracles, candles, belts, which they daily keep before your eye, your mind's ears and eyes, jostling, shouting, and coaxing. Investigate whence they came and whether they go, and then compare that religion with the pure religion of Christ and see whether the pretended observance of the life of Christ does not remind you of the fat milk or cow or, or the fattened pig, which is encouraged to grow fat, nor through the love of the animal, but for grossly mercenary motives. So even in the concluding, concluding point of Rizal's letter, Rizal here reiterates his critique, his condemnation of friarocracy and the kind of religious, religiosity that was propagated during the Spanish colonial era. Next slide. I'm now almost about to. Let me now do a reading of Rizal's feminism. Clearly, Rizal was influenced by liberalism, the more dominant uh, ideology or political thought at that point when he and the other illustrados were fighting for reforms in Spain. And the influence of liberalism is seen clearly in the idea of Rizal in the letter specifically that all human beings are born free and equal. So we are all endowed with the basic rights at the time when we are born. And God has endowed human beings with reason. This is, this is the, the, that which separates human beings from the other animals. His liberalism is also seen in his articulation of secularism and in the movement for the separation of church and state of the propaganda movement uh, in, the, in Europe. He also clearly denounced uh, feudal and patriarchal ideology of the church, as seen in his critique, not only in this letter, but also in his major works like No Limitangre and El Filibusterismo. And uh, the very important role of education in the enlightenment of the natives. These are very 
uh, very important uh, elements of liberal thought. And uh, clearly you can see that Rizal was influenced to, to feminism. And uh, the woman question was already very popular at this point in time. And Rizal's reminiscences and recollections would show to you that Rizal was already exposed to, to this liberal thinking. Uh, the ideas of Mary Wollstonecraft was already popular on the vindication of the rights of women. And that uh, the ideas of John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor, uh, his partner, uh, about the rights of women were, were already very popular in Europe at this point in time. And so uh, Rizal even uh, with uh, his other colleagues in the La Solidaridad wanted to write a separate essay or a separate work on the rights of women as a manifestation that the Ilustrados at this point in time in our history were already concerned about the women's issues and the emancipation of women in the context of the revolutionary struggle. The next slide would elaborate on Rizal, my view on Rizal's feminism. Rizal in his letter did not question the gender roles played by women and men in colonized Philippine society. He assigned to women the primary role in educating children and socializing ch children. If you recall what uh, he even uh, blamed women for the, for the backwardness as well as, to the, uh, as the, so in the socialization of uh, children who develop the slave mentality. So, uh, and he did not mention about the need for shared parenting given also the, the very, the, given the fact that the letter is short and it's not a very lengthy treatise about, about feminism. And that um, education to inculcate the values of love and defense of the country was given a primacy in the discussion or in the letter to the women of Malolos. But clearly Riza looked at women as partners of men in the struggle for independence and freedom. The next slide uh, would elaborate about uh, another reading of Rizal's feminism could be done not just uh, using the liberal feminist lens, but also using a third world and post-colonial fem feminism. Uh, third world, uh, while liberal feminism focused on sexy socialization, the way you are brought up, the way you are nurtured, the way you are impacted by religion, by the family, by the educational system, and by the media. These are, um, and these are institutionalized. So liberal feminism would, would, uh, would propose for the changing of the, the way of sexist socialization because they see it as the root of marginality or oppression of women. And the need for the kind of education that is secular, that is liberating, that is enlightening, and the need for legal reform. So the kind of education that will not um, train men to be intelligent, to be critical, to be strong, and train women to prepare them for motherhood, forced motherhood, and to train women to, to, uh, to do mainly a reproductive work and consigning them to, 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 the, to the unpaid uh, reproductive roles. So that is the kind of, that is the, the education that was heavily critiqued by the liberal feminists. But third world and post-colonial feminists, this, the kind of uh, feminism that, uh, that looks at the multiple and intersecting vulnerabilities of women in the colonies, which foreground not only gender, but foreground gender, nationality, ethnicity, and class issues, meaning they do not look at um, only the nationality issue or being subjugated by the colonizer, you know, or being a race that was subjected to the exploitation of the foreign invaders. That's what I mean by nationality. But they also look at also uh, class issues where the middle class women uh, would, would vary in their situation compared to the, to the grassroots mujer indigena, compared to the, to the likes of Sisa, the, right, the likes of Hule, uh, their situation would be different to that of Maria Clara. So that is what I meant by the class issues or the situation of the women of Malolos would be different 
to that of the situation of Hule, to the situation of Sisa. Okay, so third world and post-colonial feminism would look at women not just as a member of a particular class, not just as a member of a colonized nation, but also look at uh, women as a member of, uh, would look at women as women and the gender, uh, the oppression of women as a member of a particular gender. So that's uh, third world feminism or post-colonial feminism. And essentially you could see, uh, is there another slide? Um, results feminism, um, we, are, we agree that um, it's, uh, it is very relevant for its primacy on colonial subjugation as roots of women's subordination. We agree at some point on this view that it was colonialism that subjected women to and the men to oppression during Spanish colonial era. We cannot debate on results uh, need for defense of the motherland or the patria. This, that was very important. That was the call for the time. But uh, a lot of feminists would, uh, would critic Rizal for its limits you know, on, on his, uh, of his feminism because he did not elucidate gender oppression in his letter. Although his novels portrayed women's oppression through her characters like Maria Clara, Sisa, Hule, and the other uh, female characters. And also, if you read other works of Rizal, uh, Rizal was very much knowledgeable about the prostitution of women and the degradation of women, not only in the Philippines, but also in Europe. The next slide, please. I'm winding up my discussion. And at this point, I would like to say that Rizal remains uh, um, relevant. His ideas essentially uh, still uh, reverberates even in the current period of our history. The need for freedom from tyranny and cultural transformation via liberating education is really very, very important. This is still very important in the context of the women's movement in the Philippines. Um, we see that education is very important to transform the, the mindsets of our people in our society that is so much influenced by misogyny, by patriarchy, where men were seen as more important than women, where, we, where women are considered as objects of pleasure, where women are commodified despite our uh, advancement in the pursuit for gender equality and women empowerment, there still remains a lot of masculinist bias in our society and results a uh, project for cultural transformation via liberative education is really very relevant. Another also education as weapon to smash falsehood or obscurantism becomes more re relevant in our context of political disinformation, fake news, and the changing of the historical narratives of power seekers, as you see in the current context when we're about to have our elections in 2022. Tumahalaga yung paggamit ng isang uh, transformative na edukasyon para mabag, ma, ma check po yung pagbabago ng mga pag-check ng historical revisionism that is being peddled by those who would, by the power seekers in the context of the Philippines. And Rizal uh, put importance on the need for consciousness raising for the women to uh, eradicate them of their slave mentality of their fanaticism. And so as uh, feminists, we all are in agreement that consciousness raising is very important no? in the different levels of, uh, of uh, stages of uh, advancing women's empowerment. This is our way po forward to empower women towards greater control over their lives. And consciousness raising is a step. We should not end in consciousness raising, but um, Awakening the people, awakening the people to the in the context of results time to the horrors of colonialism and how colonialism some created false consciousness among the people, especially the Filipino women. So this is a very important uh, solution 
to uh, to address the woman question in the particular context of as a result. So at this point, I would like to thank you for your patience and for your participation in this webinar. Maraming salamat po at mabuhay tayong lahat. Mahalo. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bukoy, for that uh, informative and very interesting lecture. Before I call on our reactor, I would like to remind the participants again that they can write questions they want to ask our lecturer in our chat room, and we will read them after the reaction. Thank you. I now take pleasure in introducing our reactor to the presentation. <clears throat> A graduate of the Mindanao State University and a PhD holder from the University of the Philippines at Diliman, Dr. Bracamonte is a retired professor of sociology and sustainable development studies for 42 years. Over the years, she has been heavily engaged in various extension and research undertakings focused on women, children and health, peace and conflict, indigenous people, biodiversity, and environmental studies. She has facilitated the project on establishing a stakeholder dialogue to develop a shared agenda for mining development in the Philippines under the auspices of the International Mining for Development Center and Sustainable Minerals Institute of the University of Queensland in Australia, and was also part of the global project on the individual deprivation measure, a gender sensitive approach to poverty management as a contributing researcher for the Philippine team, which was sponsored by the Australian Research Council, Australian National University, the International Women's Development Agency, Oxfam and others. She also authored the book Bifurcating FPIC, Informed Consent or Informed Decision, a project of the Mindanao Interfaith Institute on LUMAD Studies, Rural Missionaries of the Philippines Northern Mindanao with funding support from the European Union. Her passion lies in her academic and extension involvement with the Bajau of Iligan City and the Maranao internally displaced persons. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our reactor, Dr. Nympha Lagdamen Bracamonte. Uh, salamat, June. And uh, thank you, Rai. We finally call her Durai. Uh, for that uh, great presentation. And uh, you have a very good insight, particularly on uh, third world feminism and post-colonial uh, feminism. As a sociologist, I would like to briefly, I will just skip on the Malolos women since this was already uh, extensively discussed. I would like to share my brief reactions employing the three components of sociological imagination uh, written by Mills, where in understanding society and at addressing social problems, the sociological imagination is the awareness of the relationship between the personal experience and in the wider context of our history. And these are biography, history, biography, and society. First, history. As we all know, the Spanish colonial rule for centuries, whose ill effects are embedded in the two famous novels, are, of course, depicting a passionate exposure of the evils of Spanish rule in the country and Rizal's reputation as the leading spokesperson of the Philippine reform movement. When the Spaniards came to the Philippines, of course, they brought along with them the patriarchal values and the feudal social relations, which eventually dispersed into the Philippine culture, which barred the women from participating in political undertakings. And of course, during that time, the Spanish 
uh, friars were on the lookout for subversive activities and frowned upon the Malolos project that would empower women. Now the biography, so that was brief history, biography. Rizal belonged to an affluent family and was able to get schooled in Spain, but his family was a victim of land grabbing, oppression and abuse. Their huge family lands and properties were confiscated. And so it was said that Rizal suffered from painful experiences. His mother was arrested and was uh, made to walk 16 kilometers from Calamba, where she was ordered to be imprisoned in Santa Cruz in 1871. Well, of course, he was released after two and a half years. With respect to feminism, I hope I will not muddle the issue here, uh, June and Fred, but I know that he, Rizal had several women in her lives. Maybe <laughs> Rizal was um, <laughs> and he captures the heart of women. He had earlier friendship with Sigonda Katigbak and an eight-year romantic relationship with a distant cousin, Leonor Rivera, who is thought to be the inspiration to the character of Maria Clara in Nola Mitangri and El Filibosterismo. In one recorded uh, detailing Rizal's visit to Prague, according to Maximo Viola, he had a relationship with somebody. In 1890, Rizal, at the age of 29, left Paris for Brussels as he was preparing for the publication of the annotation of Antonio de Morga's Successos de las Islas Filipinas. He lived in the boarding house of the Jacobi sisters. And according to historian Zaidi, Rizal had his romance with Suzanne Jacobi, 45, but they also suspected that he had also a liaison with a 17-year-old girl niece. Well, of course, we don't discredit that he's a patriot, he has contributed a lot, but these are some of the part of his biography that you know continues to amuse me and whether what's the meaning, it's really up to the Knights of Rizal and to us. From December 1891 to June 1892, Rizal lived with his family in Hong Kong as he practiced ophthalmology and the period of his life included his recorded affections of which many women were identified like Gertrude Bickett of London, the wealthy and high-minded Nelly Boston of the English and Liberian, Iberian merchant family, and the last descendant of a noble Japanese family fam uh, known as affectionately as Osi San. And then in 1895, at the age of 33, Rizal met Josephine Bracken. They fell in love with each other, and this woman became his uh, common law wife in the Pitan. Back to Rizal's feminism. According to the analysis of Nakpil, there could be two typologies of women uh, that Rizal depicted. One was the weak, timid, and the gullible, whom he despised. And the other one is the typology of the intelligent, analytical, and resolute. Rizal's official biographer notes that there was a trace of bitterness in the scorn. There is little doubt that he would have wanted the Filipina to be loved, not only because of her beauty and sweetness of character, but also because of her strength amid loftiness of purpose. And the town, the, the women of Malolos, uh, when Rizal learned about this, and I think uh, Duray has mentioned this, that he realized that not all the Filipinas were uh, Maria Clara. So this must be the intelligent, analytical, and resolute, and needless much to say, uh, he had really many uh, good insights and advices regarding the women of Malolos. I will not go into the detail, but Durano's letter, uh, analysis of the results letter to the women of Malolos emphasized the capability and reason which uh, Rizal has reiterated. And indeed, Rizal left a legacy for women. 
he appealed to be to the women to be needful, heedful of their rights and not to be docile. Now the society, so that was history, biography, and society. Rizal, uh, at that time, there were structural dysfunctions as evidenced by a decadent society, and Rizal inevitably has opened the eyes of the world and our country to the inherent ills of colonialism and inspired our brave forefathers and mothers to lay their lives for freedom and democracy. And of course, one of those who was inspired by him was Andres Bonifacio, who was more revolutionary indeed. And let me just, you know, quote him with this uh, lasting uh, quotations. As mentioned uh, already, according to him, na kailangan, uh, to Duray, na kailangan bigyan ng gender sensitive language. But uh, there are three quotations I would like to quote. He who does not know how to look back at where he came from will never get to his destination and that there are no tyrants where there are no slaves. And the third one has something to do with women. According to Rizal, let her be loved not only for her beauty and amiable character, but also for her strength of mind and loftiness of purpose, which enliven and raise the feeble and the timid and ward of all vain thoughts. Let her be the pride of her country and let her command respect. At this juncture, I would like to share that Rizal was also depicted the importance and significance of women, religion, and science in his art and sculpture. His, face, his most famous his sculptural work was the triumph of science over death. This is a clay sculpture of a naked young woman with overflowing hair standing on a skull while bearing a torch held high. The woman symbolized the ignorance of humankind during the dark ages, while the torch she bore symbolized the enlightenment science that brings over to the whole world. He sent this reportedly sculpture as a gift to his dear friend, Ferdinand Blumentritt, along with another one named the triumph of death over life. And the woman, this triumph of death over life is shown reportedly trampling the skull, a symbol of death to signify the victory the humankind has achieved by conquering the bane of death through scientific advancement. The original sculpture is now displayed, I am not really seeing this, at the Rizal Shrine Museum at Fort Santiago in Entramoros, Manila. A large replica made of concrete stands in front of Ferdinand Calderon Hall, the building which houses the College of Medicine, UP Manila. So yun lang siguro because we are running out of time, although I wanted to post a tickler, pero baka uh, madrag na into, ano ba? <laughs> so thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, many thanks, Dr. Bracamonte, for your insightful comments. Uh, we now start the Q&A portion, but our lecturer can start it off by responding to the comments of the reactor. After that, I will read the written questions. Do Thank I? you. Thank you, Nympha, for amplifying the using the sociological imagination lens where the the, the, the individual like Rizal is shaped by the, the context or the live milieu where he is in. So that live milieu of um, oppression felt by his parents, the discrimination that he himself felt uh, contributed to also to his awakening and to, to his activism uh, in the context of the 19th century Philippines. Um, since my focus is on Results feminism as contained in the letter of Rizal to the women of Malolos, I did not mention already about his other works, as well as his love life and his, um, and his uh, sexuality, 
because he was very young when he was in Europe. And uh, he had a lot of girlfriends. But I think the fact that there were no, uh, there were no complaints of sexual harassment against Jose Rizal, I would like to believe that he was a gentleman. Okay. And uh, so I would, um, I would like to respond to comments here about uh, uh, from, the, from the floor saying about um, agreeing that Rizal's uh, view of uh, liberating education is much needed in our particular context now where there is so much uh, misinformation, where there's so much uh, historical revisionism, et cetera. Thank you very much, Professor Ro Sanchez of Davao, um, member of the Women's Studies Association of the Philippines, Dr. Helen Dayo, for uh, affirming results feminism. When I was young, um, I was also part of the debate, who is more, who, who should be the national hero, Rizal or Bonifacio? But I set aside that uh, debate because I, my main focus is Rizal and we have to value significantly his contribution to Philippine nationalism and our struggle for independence. So I set aside that debate. Okay, uh, do you have any comment coming from my friends from UP Los Banos? Thank you, UPLB Pahinungod. My friend from UP Visayas, Dr. Rosario Asong. If you would like to add more to discussion on results feminism, feel free, feel free to come in. Uh, before, before we do that, I'd like to read the questions uh, written on the on our chat room. Uh, mm -hmm. Here's one question. Uh, what is your assessment of contemporary Filipina women's, uh, especially the younger generation of women, uh, reactions or responses in light of what appears to be uh, misogynistic and patriarchal? Um, oh, uh, let me see. 30. I lost it. Patriarchal government leadership. The question is, what is your comment on the uh, women's, the current women's reaction or responses in light of what appears to be a um, misogynistic and patriarchal government leadership? Okay, if Rizal were writing to at this point in time in our history, I think he would uh, take a position against. Uh, Patriarchy and against a misogyny of government. You're asking me about uh, women's reaction to the misogyny of yes. those in power. I think that's the question. Yes. Um, as, come, as one coming from the women's movement, uh, we are strongly condemning any form of misogyny, any form of um, sexism, whether it is expressed by the leader or other, or by men or other people. So we are very, very clear that um, misogyny or sexism as it is defined in the law, the latest law is Republic Act 11301, it's the Safe Space Act, where uh, women's or where, where men's power is seen in the language that subordinates and degrades women. So that is an example of misogyny or sexism. So the, the reaction of the, the women should be one that condemns this that corrects this, and then that calls for uh, ending all forms of misogyny and sexism, whether they're in print, whether they are in the, in the books, or whether they are in the concrete practices of individuals in our country. So that's uh, my categorical answer. Okay, uh, another question. How do we best address the Doña Victorinas, the Doña Consolaciones, and <laughs> Sister Penchangs in our contemporary society. Thank you for that question. My, my paper is <laughs> really limited to uh, results, feminist ideas in the letter to the women of Malolos. But you asked me about to comment on Doña Victorina Dede Espadaña. <laughs> Uh, one of the very famous characters in Rizal's novel, which exemplifies uh, women, uh, very assertive women in a way, who wanted to be like 
the European in looks and in ways. So this Adonia Victorina de de Espadaña, married to a henpick Spanish, uh, would typify in a way an empowered woman, but empowered in a different way. In the sense that she would like to be to look like the Spaniard by putting a lot of whitening on her face, uh, the rice powder that uh, was common during the time. And in the modern time, she would be resurrected uh, among women who use a lot of whitening chemicals on their face with the hope that they will become uh, beautiful like white women. So the, the colonial mentality and the false consciousness of Doña Victorina de Espadaña should be condemned in a way and should be changed. But we have a lot of replica of hers in the contemporary times, the colonial mentality and the desire to be like white, white people in looks uh, would be uh, an example of those that were criticized by Rizal. Okay. Okay, uh, this is a hypothetical question on Rizal. If he were brown, if he were born, I think, in 1981, instead of 1861, how would he react to the current political situation where a number of women like the Lima, Reza, and others uh, fell victim to Duterte's government? Would he write in defense of them? I think uh, consistent to his view on his liberal thinking, on his upholding of uh, human rights, in his upholding of reason, I think Rizal would uh, be very critical of uh, human rights violations, including EJK, mm -hmm. including, as mentioned by Dr. Abines, uh, the use of uh, the terror law to suppress. So I think Dr. Um, our one, the first lecture, you know, talk about uh, applying results. So applying results uh, in this contemporary time, he, consistent to his view, he would be very critical of um, any forms of human rights violations. Okay, that's all I have uh, in our chat room. Any questions from, from the audience? You can raise your hand. Uh, here's a point from Raymond. Uh, secularism, liberalism, and progressivism are increasingly getting attacked not only in the Philippines, but also in the US and other countries consequently undermined against the struggle for women's rights. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Okay, maybe aside from me, my my fellow, my feminist friends who are in attendance in this virtual forum would be able to add more points to that. Uh, in the context of the, the trending towards rightism, which is an attack on secularism, which Rizal fought for, um, would be a, a threat to, it's really a threat to a threat to our struggle for human rights and freedoms. And so uh, we have to, to contest at the realm maybe of uh, the mind, at the realm of organizing uh, this trend towards, towards retrogression and uh, continue to uphold the progressive ideas of Rizal and other patriots of the Philippine revolution and uh, make that alive through social media and through the through the educational system, because um, these threats really are would be real, and it would really impinge on the the rights of women. Like for example, if uh, in the context of America there are groups already there trying to change the concept of sexual and reproductive health rights of women. In America, you allow abortion. In the Philippines, not. But we are on one hand that women should exercise autonomy over their bodies. Women should, should be able to space the number of children that they should have. Women should be to have in control over their bodies and it should not be men who will define it for them. And uh, attempts to, 
to negate the gains of the women's movement with regard the advancement of fundamental rights, including sexual and reproductive health rights, will be a threat to the women's movement. And the women's movement from the different parts of the world continue to, to contest this at the level of the UN uh, assemblies, every time we have UN conferences at, at, at the regional level and also at the grassroots level. And so the struggle could be at the grassroots level. And in the upcoming elections, uh, a group of women under the Women 2022 group led by no less than the, the chair of the former chair of the Philippine Commission of Women, Tati Benitez Licuanan, we are pushing for the women's agenda uh, to end kagutuman at uh, uh, ka, ano pa, yung lahat ng mga, mga issues ng kababaihan sa Pilipinas. As a way to, to defend the gains that the Philippine women's movement has achieved, making the Philippines one of the top ranking country when it comes to gender equality and women empowerment. Uh, before we were in the top 10, now we slid into uh, number 17 in the latest global gender gap ranking, but still uh, we have made significant inroads here in the Philippines in advancing women's rights and human rights. We continue to be vigilant. We continue to organize. We continue to raise awareness to, to heed what Rizal said, raising the consciousness of women so that they do not remain complacent, they do not remain ignorant, and their votes will not be sold during election. And they will remain to guard our, our history from historical revisionism, which puts the enemies and puts those who are responsible for our current uh, stagnation as heroes instead of culprits of the plunder of this nation. Any other comments or questions? Uh, I would just like to add to uh, Dr. Bokoy's explanation. And I think that uh, the political economy as a framework is really, uh, is really very dominant and in fact, there are those who theorize that even this uh, uh, pandemic now has this, uh, you know, uh, wing, and, and and therefore we we see that the hegemony of these powerful nations trying to control the world is there, basically in all our lives. So that when we speak of inequalities, we don't only look at the the, the human rights according to the parlance of uh, feminism or gender issues, because uh, this issue uh, obviously uh, obfuscates in the real world and it interlaces or it intersects with other social indicators in the world today, like, uh, like the, the ethnicity, like social class, like age, for instance, and nations, whether you are developed or you're uh, underdeveloped or developing nation. So in other words, uh, those who are advancing human rights uh, are always uh, struggling because there are, uh, there are obstacles that are you know, seen in this world that it seems that there are powerful nations that, that would try to control or what we call the hegemony of uh, this world so that any advancements uh, in terms of political rights, in terms of uh, women's rights and other rights, uh, the, the rights of the IPs will always be uh, obfuscated by those who want to hold on to power. And if you look at the, the, the macro level, the world today, these are very much replicated in the micro level, even now in the in the barangay or even in the, you know, because there is the replication of uh, this thing. Those who hold the political, uh, you know, position, those who hold power are also those who want to control of the economy. And therefore, uh, progressive movements all over the world uh, will always be a threat. And therefore, according to Dr. Bukoy, there should be a continuing awareness safeguarding of our rights and 
we can only do that if we have, you know, this global solidarity on top of our local, you know, agropatients here for what should be the social transformation uh, of our country that would benefit, you know, everyone for the greater masses. Kasi hindi lahat ng mga women are uh, gender, you know, aware and to that effect. Yung mga donya donya. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments? Um, Sir Mark, do you want to say anything? Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, well, thank you very much for this very insightful and powerful lecture. No? Um, you know, uh, we really need this this kind of activity or event. No? We should take advantage of this pandemic, you know, that uh, we meet no, quite virtually. Lang. Uh, for us to, to do our mandated mission as Knights of Rizal. That's why I really commend the Aloha chapter for doing this. No? Uh, this kind of activity uh, is badly needed by by us now no because of what's really happening in our country and i'd like also to commend the speakers uh, our our lecturer dr dr bukoy and the uh, reactor dr uh, bracamonte for uh, for giving us and sharing us uh, uh, new insights that that are helpful especially to those who are really studying rizal you know uh rizal is uh, an advocate of uh, women empowerment and gender equality. And uh, by reading Rizal's work, by studying his life, we can say that he's still relevant up until up to now. No? And uh, just like to put some premium on the quality, the, on the importance of education, the role of education as mentioned by uh, our lecturer, no? that uh, by, by, by uh, looking at Looking at, at from the the the, the uh, accomplishments of Rizal, the writings of Rizal, makikita na natin kung ano ba talaga yung isang Pilipino. Because all we know, Rizal is the symbol of uh, of our country, and uh, I, I'm I'm also happy that our lecture also mentioned about the fake news and misinformation, and uh, this only teaches us to to be just like Rizal. No, let's all be critical on what's really happening right now. Yeah, just like Rizal, and uh, again, uh, studying Rizal is uh, let, let, as a Knights of Rizal. Let's make studying Rizal as an enthusiastic, enthusiastic uh, one. And uh, by studying Rizal, lahat uh, mapupunta yan sa usapin ng pagmamahal sa bayan. No, uh, at uh, finally, I'd like. I'd like also to 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 share my insight don sa sinas sinas sinabi kanina na madaming girlfriend si Rizal, no? Uh, it's a yeah, it's a fact, no? And that fact is a manifestation that Rizal is only human, no? Therefore, he is a he he is human, no? And we are also human. We can be like Rizal, and if we can say we can be like Rizal, no? We can show to other people and to other nations. How uh, how strong our love country, no? How 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 passionate we are in loving our country. Hashtag just like Rizal. Again, maraming salamat po for for having this kind of uh, of event. No, I, I I hope to be part of the future sessions that you will have. Congratulations, uh, Aloha chapter. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Sir Mark. Um, okay, any other comments? If none, then well, it has been a lively exchange of ideas. And uh, I would like to thank our distinguished lecturer and our equally distinguished reactor, as well as uh, the participants for this very interesting educational exercise. Uh, it is my hope that this lecture has given us a better understanding of our national heroes uh, views on women. Before we end, though, uh, I would like to request uh, everybody to. Uh, oh, by the way, we we are issuing actually certificates of uh, attendance. So if you are interested in getting one, just uh, let us know. You can email me 
Uh, my email address is uh, June Call Me. That's uh, J U N C O L M E at yahoo.com. Okay. So uh, this ends our ninth lecture in the Rizalian lecture series sponsored by the Knights of Rizal Aloha chapter. Uh, tune in for the next Zoom lecture, which will be on November 20th, 2021, same time. Uh, Sir Dr. Raymond Leonson, retired professor of Philippine Studies at the University of Hawaii Leeward Community College, will be our next lecturer. And he will talk on the topic, the Noli and the Philly as resistance literature and the relentless quest for a just and humane society. Until then, mahalo and aloha to all of you. Stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Salamat. Thank you again, Dr. Bokoy. Thank you, Dr. Bracamonte. Sa inyo, Thank you, Darai. Thank you, Nima. Tama mo, panayod to sa inyo, panihapon. Thank you, Sir Mark, for joining us. I miss you. Thank you. Daghang salamat. Thank you, Sir Mark. Lang tayo ng time, John. Yes, Ibarra, Tabarra. Tess, thank you.